Okay, good morning everybody and uh, thanks for the invitation to speak here uh, online and uh, so okay, uh, so can I please have the, the next slide? Yes, so this is the, <clears throat> the contents of my talk, uh, there will be a brief introduction. Uh, I will say quite a bit about uh, Lala's main book, Science and Modernity, in section two, uh, and then focus a, a bit more and uh, give a certain more uh, assessment uh, of uh, Lala's view of techno science, and there are brief uh, concluding remarks. So, so can I have? Uh, so let me say start uh, with uh, some introductory comments. So. As far as I remember, I have never uh, met uh, Sir John Lalas per in person. So maybe I've seen one say a, a presentation by him, but uh, I cannot really remember. It's a long time ago. But what I have done is I have um, uh, studied uh, part of his work and uh, discussed it in uh, two publications. So, so one publication is uh, uh, a review I wrote in uh, 2002, uh, a review of the book Science and Modernity, and it uh, appeared in the International uh, Studies in the Philosophy of Science, I think a, a journal that is also related to, uh, to Lalas and, and, and the Dubrovnik uh, uh, conferences. Uh, and the second thing is in uh, 2019, I discussed uh, Lala's work uh, in a chapter on the relationship between uh, science and technology, and that's in my book, uh, From Commodification to the Common Good, Reconstructing Science, Technology and Society. So in, in studying uh, the work of Lala's, I, uh, I felt a clear uh, congeniality, so both with his philosophical approach, oh, and, and with uh, several of his views. And uh, now, say, uh, I also read, say, the memorial review by uh, Dr. Uh, Boris Kosniak, and I learned also from that review a further agreement uh, with the work of Lalas. So like him, I started my career as a physicist, and, and moreover, my doctoral dissertation, dating back from 1984, also included an extensive study of the work uh, of Niels Bohr, the Danish uh, uh, physicist, and, and both Bohr's scientific and his philosophical work. Huh? Uh, finally, say a remarkable and I think also a commendable uh, feature of Lelias is his interest in politics. And like him, I share such an interest. But uh, in contrast to me, he has actually been practicing been a practicing uh, politician, serving as a as an assistant and deputy minister of higher education in Croatia. I think in the uh, years ninety two and ninety three, probably difficult years. So that is also a very uh, special aspect. Yeah. Okay. Now the second uh, session. Yes, yeah, science uh, and modernity toward an integral theory of science. And so. <clears throat> In this section, what I'll do is I'll make some general comments on Lala's main book, Science and Modernity. I do not go in, into much detail. It's, it's, it's a big work, and so there, there is no, no there's not the opportunity to go into uh, uh, big detail. But my comments, they are based on three things. Say, first, say a rereading of parts of the, of the work, of some of the work of uh, Sir John uh, Lala's and also rereading my own earlier co uh, comments on it, and then also situating uh, Lela's work in, say, in, in the current uh, philosophical landscape. So, so can I have the following slide? Slide three. Yeah. Oh, no, no, slide two. I'm sorry. Can you go back to slide two still? Is this uh, the right one? This is, this is, it. yeah, okay, okay. So, so uh, as I said, uh, in 2002, I wrote a review of science and modernity, and it started as follows, and on the slide is this quotation, I read this quotation. Science and modernity is an ambitious, difficult, thoughtful book. It is ambitious because it aims to provide a comprehensive account of science. <clears throat> as such, it's limited to science in a narrow sense but deals 
extensively with natural and cultural preconditions and context. Hence, the book covers an astonishing wide ground. So some comments on this. Say an obvious feature of the development of philosophy of science and probably also philosophy more general during the past decades, that is an increasing specialization and fragmentation. Well, talking about philosophy of science before the 1970s, uh, philosophy of science was a small discipline, say with a limited number of journals edited in volumes and monographs. Huh? But since then, so journals and books have multiplied and they have focused on ever more specific subjects, disciplines and methods. So quite a few journals or maybe many journals, they address particularly subjects or disciplines. So they are not just say a journal of philosophy, but they are called, for instance, the journal of critical realism or biology and philosophy or the Journal of Agricultural and Environmental Ethics. So this specialization and fragmentation, and specialization has, it has certainly in a positive sense, significantly increased our knowledge and understanding of actual scientific practices. But there is also another side of the coin and that is that it has led to an increasing fragmentation of the study of science and consequently, a lack of focus on broader issues and concepts, or even a lack of focus on broader conceptions. So in some, this trend resulted in the neglect of what is called general philosophy of science. So a, ten, a telling example is this. So you have the journal of general philosophy of science, it's German journal. And so at one point I in discussion, the editors said, yeah, our journal is now also specialized. There are not many, uh, say, general uh, articles in that. So that even in the journal with that title, you see that specialization. So I think that Science and Modernity is an important book because it goes against that trend of specialization and fragmentation. And it aims uh, to be at, as it said in the subtitle, say an integral, integral theory of science. So as such, it discusses all kinds of issues. So I have them here in the bullets uh, on the slides. Uh, the historical origin of science and its place in world history. And it addresses crucial biological neurological, linguistic, social, and in particular, technological aspects of the development of science. And in terms of disciplinary resources, the book is also open-minded. It addresses and exploits a host of relevant studies from a variety of disciplines. Well, clearly this methodological broadness makes it also a difficult book. I think also difficult for the author probably to, to be able to connect all these threads into a coherent book whole. But of course, also, and certainly in these, in these times, difficult for the readers because, okay, readers are specialized. They know everything about scientific explanation, but then there is so, something about say the origin of science. And so for the readers, it's, it is also difficult, but I think still very worthwhile. And of course, uh, books like this, hey, they should need consider. They should not be considered like the last word on on the topics they discussed. No, they should be uh, they studied and debated and maybe questioned. But to judge, to be able to judge, say the uh, the stronger and the weaker points of such books requires to to study them in detail in uh, its content. Yeah. So the subtitle of this book is, as I said, to board an integral theory of science. And uh, I also find this uh, quite uh, congenial to my approach and which I recently called synthetic philosophy and hence the title of my presentation, the synthetic philosophy of Sergian uh, Lalas. And synthetic philosophy is synthesizing. It's not analytic, but it, it synthesizes and it aims to synthesize or integrate a variety of perspectives 
on the complex entanglements of science, technology, and society. Okay, can I have the following slides? Yeah. So one more specific topic uh, in the book is this. It's the topic of naturalism. Huh? Uh, Lelas uh, characterizes his uh, philosophical approach as naturalistic. And, but here we should be more precise because he advocates say, a very broad interpretation of naturalism uh, because he sees as natural, not just say the natural of the natural sciences, but also historical, social and cultural phenomena. And this contrasts to, I think, most of the more usual naturalistic approaches, uh, because uh, in, in, in many of those approaches, they are much more narrow in this, for instance, in the sense that they see, say, the, net, the knowledge produced in the natural science as the only valuable knowledge, or maybe somewhat bigger as the best knowledge there is. Huh? And that is that means that this narrow kind of naturalism often tends to uh, to the the doctrine of what is called scientism. If we see that this from the perspective of uh, Lelas, uh, I think net narrow scientific naturalism often includes what Lelas calls divine knowledge or the surrogate surrogate of divine knowledge. Huh? And but in the first, first part of the book, uh, this idea of divine knowledge and surrogates has been, I think, rightly and thoroughly criticized uh, by uh, Lelas. Okay, so far about uh, naturalism. Uh, there is one issue I feel that is somewhat underdeveloped in the book, and it has to do with the notion of naturalism, and then in particular with the relation between uh, naturalism and normativity. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, so consider this example. So in chapter 11 of the book, uh, let us speaks about modes of living. Huh? And one mode of living is the modern mode of living. And he says about this, the modern mode of living of humans is, and I quote, as entrepreneurs and businessmen. Put differently, modern life is seen as being do dominated by technology and economics. The connection between the two is also uh, expressed, say, in the Heideggerian claim, and also, I quote this also, the essence of modern technology is commodification. Now, of course, uh, there is here a normative question, namely, is this mode of living a desirable mode of living huh? for citizens, but also for scientists? Huh? And this complex question, it's a complex question, is not addressed in detail, in any detail in the book. Huh? So central to uh, Lela's conception is the notion of a human science. That is a science that can be practiced by actual humans with their capabilities and their constraints and limitations. Huh? So far, so good. Huh? But then, there is a small shift. Huh? Part three of the book that is not called human science, but it's called humane science. Huh? And also, I also refer here to, to, to the review of uh, Boris Kozniak, who characterizes uh, Lelas as a humanist. Huh? And this is also related to this notion of humane. Huh? So in uh, English, uh, Humane is a term with strong normative connotations. Huh? So my dictionary explains humane as kind, tender, merciful, humanizing. Huh? And so there is a problem because actual human science is by no means automatically a humane science. Huh? A science that is kind, tender, merciful, and humanizing. So therefore, the crucial question is, on what basis can a non-humane practice 
practices and knowledges be identified, criticized, and changed for the better. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, science and modernity has an approach that is primarily descriptive and explanatory. Surely, when you scrutinize it, you will see that it also contains various normative presuppositions. But they remain in, say, in the body of the work, they remain largely implicit, but not completely. So uh, surprisingly, at the end of the book, the, the very last pages, Lella's voices a serious concern, a serious uh, normative concern, and it is the concern about the increasing commodification and commercialization of contemporary science. He voices his concern, but still closes the book with, uh, with an expression of hope. Namely, he says that, and I quote here, it's, yeah, it's also on the slide here, uh, we can perhaps protect science from its full commercialization, bring science and philosophy together, and with their help change our mode of living, so the modern mode of living, in a deliberate and controlled fashion. Well, let me uh, say that I fully share this concern, but I, th I think that philosophy alone cannot accomplish such a desired change. Maybe it can contribute a bit, but it cannot accomplish it. So, so what is also needed, I think, in this respect, that is an active resistance to the commodification of scientific practices and the creative development of alternatives. Well, let me just mention a project in which I'm involved at the moment uh, uh, that, that, that tries to, to go uh, along such lines. So I'm, I'm writing a paper, it's called Medical Research Without Patents. And uh, it argues that the causes of the very high prices of medicines, drugs, they are uh, related, say, to the monopolies that big pharmaceutical companies acquire. And, uh, and so then the question is, if you do away with these mo monopolies, can then the prices uh, for medicines, maybe they, 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 they could be much lower and therefore medicines would be much more broadly uh, affordable and accessible and so on. Okay, but that's a bit of a side line. Can I have the following uh, slide? Okay, the section three is about uh, one specific issue uh, in the book, and it is an issue in which uh, I am uh, uh, have been interested for a long time, and uh, Lalas, uh, it's also a central issue in, uh, in his work. Huh? So here, so there are many uh, philosophers of technology and some philosophers of science, not too many, uh, that subscribe to the view that science and technology, that they are intimately related. Huh? Some of these philosophers hold that this has always been the case. Others think that this is a more recent phenomenon. And here in this respect, you often hear the, the, the date 1980, the start of neoliberalism. And so the term technoscience is often used for this phenomenon. And for instance, here uh, by many authors here, Jean-Francois Lyotard, Donna Haraway, Bruno Latour, Don Eide, and Alfred Nordman. And also in a somewhat uh, different tradition, you have the views by uh, some older word, Martin Heidegger, Jürgen Habermas, also the German philosopher, Peter Janich, and here also, uh, Sir Jan Lelas. In addition, I think there is a lot of uh, attention for technoscience these days. Uh, and I, I meant, want to mention here two recent uh, examples. First, Massimiliano Simons. So I mentioned here this article. What is it called? The Technoscientific Practices and Informational. No, sorry, sorry. Jean Francois Lyotard and Postmodern Technoscience. It's just one of his articles, but uh, Massimiliano has written several other uh, uh, papers on this issue. 
And the second here is a recent book by Federica Russo, Techno Scientific Practices and in Informational Approach. Okay, what I will do in this uh, presentation is I will distinguish between a weak and a strong interpretation of the notion of techno science. That means I will defend the weak interpretation, especially against traditional theory focused philosophy of science. On the other hand, I will present a critical account of the strong interpretation, especially of its assumption that science and technology are basically or even essentially the same. Just one comment here. I think an important advantage of the weak interpretation is that it uh, allows us to vindicate the social value of basic research. Huh? You see, if, if the strong interpretation is true, then all science is technological from the start and the notion of basic research that, that loses its, its meaning. Can I have the next slide? Yeah, so first, uh, the defense of the weak interpretation of techno science. Just, uh, I realized that the slide itself may be somewhat uh, confusing because I mentioned uh, all kind of authors here and books, but these books are not meant as defenses of uh, the weak interpretation of techno science, but they, I use them in an argumentation to say that a defense of the weak notion of techno science is still badly needed, even today or even recently. Okay, the weak interpretation of uh, the notion of techno science is that science and technology are, and have always been, intimately related, both empirically in an empirical sense, say, uh, studying the relations between scientists and technologists, but also conceptually, so in the, in, in the interpretations of um, the nature of science and the nature of technology. So science and technology sh share a number of philosophically, socially, and morally important features. Huh? One of those, and an important one, uh, is that uh, the techno-scientific approach, it highlights the significance of materiality for both science and technology. Say very important, and also in the work of Lelas. Huh? So we can acknowledge this point, say the point of the weak interpretation, by metaphorically speaking about science and technology as not identical, but as two sides of a coin. That's a phrase I learned from Peter Cruz. Huh? So as I said, uh, in mainstream philosophy of science, you still find a lot of theory focused or theory central. Uh, accounts of science. Huh? And uh, in that mainstream uh, philosophy of science, it's still the case that uh, substantial studies of the significance of technology for science, they are relatively rare. And now I come to these four illustrations on the, on the slide. Huh? So a remarkable one I found in, in a book by uh, Quine. It's a somewhat older book, but I mention it because it's remarkable. It's from 1990. And on page two, Quine does acknowledge, and I quote, that technology and modification of the environment, and thus that includes technology, and the control and modification of the environment, and that includes technology, that is what Quine calls a major purpose of science. Huh? It's on page two, but the rest of the, the book has nothing about that major purpose. That, that is uh, typical. A second example is uh, the philosophy of science in Encyclopedia. It's edited by Sahotra Sarkar and Jessica Pfeiffer, 2006. If you look at its index, there are 110 differentiated items related to theory with only nine quite general, general items about technology. Maybe I could add here that most of those nine are in my, <laughs> in, in my uh, item about experimentation. 
So, so it's really, it's really almost absent. Huh? A third example is uh, the work of Philip Kitcher. Actually, I think Philip Kitcher, I, I like his work a lot, and he is an important, very important current philosopher. He, I think he is also a synthetic philosopher. He has done work in a great variety of issues. So that's not the point here. But I want to, to, to focus on one aspect of his work, and, um, and especially what he, how he writes about it, say, in his uh, books about the role of science in a democratic society. But in, <coughs> sorry, in the book, Kitzer advocates what I call a science as knowledge account. Huh? And he interprets this knowledge as uh, in a set of certified and hence correct and reliable statements. But as you well, could guess now, science does more than providing statements. Huh? Through experimentation and experimental technologies, it also provides realizations of statements, say to realize those statements in the actual material and social world. Huh? For instance, science does not only teaching, teach us where to find fresh water, this is an example of kitchens, but also includes laboratory procedures for making fresh water. Huh? Similarly, Kitzer writes a lot about climate science, but does not mention climate engineering. Thus, he has a blind spot for the important relations between science and technology. And in his case, this neglect has uh, significant implications, not the least for Kitzer's own project that aims for a more democratic organization of the, of the role of science in our current societies. And the point is that the general public is confronted with the results of the sciences also, but I think even primarily, through their contribution to technologies. So if, you, if your aim is to, to increase, say, the democratic role of the public in the sciences, you cannot leave it to science alone. You have to, you have to also to... to uh, take account of the relationship between science and technology. A final, um, a final point, uh, and very recent actually, uh, th that is from the book I mentioned it already, Federica Russo, Techno-Scientific Practices. She has scrutinized seven recent introductions to the philosophy of science. So, so really for the, the, the starting students. Huh? And say the astonishing results is that these these introductions, they are all Anglo-American. They do not or hardly mention the crucial relationship between science and technology. So in this way, say this theory focused uh, view of science is, is reproduced through these uh, 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 introductions. So my conclusion is then that to emphasize the intimate and to study the intimate relationship between science and technology, say, to the weak notion of technoscience that is still badly needed. Okay, the next slide. Yeah, so now I come to uh, the strong interpretation uh, of uh, technoscience. Huh? And strong interpretations of the notion of technoscience, so they deny that there are any significant distinctions between science and technology. Huh? And furthermore, they draw far-reaching philosophical consequences from that claim. Huh? In particular, they argue that the objects studied and the methods used in scientific and technological practices are basically the same. Consequently, since science and technology can and should be, uh, science and technology can and should be philosophically interpreted in the same way. This strong interpretation is also endorsed by Lelas in his account of science as technology. So this uh, phrase of science as technology can be considered as a, a somewhat more specific form of the techno-scientific uh, interpretation. <coughs> So especially in 1993, he published a journal in the British 
an article in the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science, actually uh, in parentheses, there's a lot of Heidegger in that, in that article. And I'm sure this is the article with the most references to Heidegger. And since then there have not been many more uh, references to Heidegger in that British Journal for the Philosophy of Science. Huh? But okay, that is in parentheses. Huh? So let us state, for instance, that the old slogan, science discover, discovers, technology invents, huh? should be substituted by the Heideggerian phrase that science discovers because it invents. Huh? And he, he literally uh, says so. Huh? Okay, that's the last. Uh, equally strong views are held by Bruno Latour and Alfred Nordman. So strong, uh, they also held, hold the, the strong interpretation of techno science. Eh? So Nordman, for instance, stated that the principal characteristics of the age of techno science, he uses this word, we live in the age of techno science. And the principal feature is that the scientific, that is, the natural objects are not separated anymore from the technological, from the artificial object. So there is an, say, an, an inherent entanglement between the natural and the artificial. I see six problems of this strong interpretation. And yeah, I can here only mention them. I can only mention them. Uh, the, each of those points, uh, yeah, would require much more argumentation, and there has been much more argumentation, but for the purpose of this uh, lecture, I can only mention them. So the first is, the uh, first problem is that this, this strong interpretation of techno science neglects specific aims of theoretical science. These aims include, for instance, and I mentioned this, the understanding of phenomena with the help of intelligible theory. So here you can think of Hank de Rechts' work, his book, Understanding, Scientific Understanding from 2017. I think put differently, so some form of theory of you, criticized by Lelas of science, has it place in science. But I, I agree it has to be qualified in several ways. So it's not the simple uh, theory of view that uh, Lelas uh, discusses. And second point here on the, on the slide is, um, so in support of the stronger interpretation, Lelas states that there is a full continuity between high scientific theory and sk the skills of the experimenter. And also, specifically, I quote, theory can be considered a condensed set of instruction of how to build an experimental apparatus. Well, that is problematic because even if it is true that high scientific theory, for instance, quantum physics, tells you something about the experimental process, it can in no way be be said to be a set of instructions for producing experimental artifacts. Huh? Take, say, as I said, quantum physics, it does not even suffice to construct, uh, say, to construct and use the theoretical models of laser phenomena. And let alone, it, quantum physics does not tell you in, in detail uh, how to build lasers. Huh? And so, so it's, uh, Nancy Cartwright already in her 1983 book uh, has already uh, written a lot about it. And uh, Lelos has uh, this book in, in his, in, uh, has the, the reference to this book in, in Science and Modernity, but he doesn't apparently draw this consequence. Huh? A, a further thing here is that, uh, yeah, the, the interpretation of Lelos looks a bit like uh, the operationalist theory of meaning, huh? that, uh, that the meaning of a concept in science or maybe of any concept uh, coincides with the operations that should be carried out to verify it. Huh? But uh, this operational the uh, theory of meaning is vulnerable to the well-known criticism that it entails a, an unfruitful problem of theoretical concepts. Huh? And it neglects the systemic significance of theoretical frameworks. Already Carl Hempel uh, put 
put forward with this uh, criticism. Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, so the third, uh, this, this relates to my own work that I think the concept in science, uh, this, the concept we use in theoretical statements, they uh, possess a non-local meaning. And this meaning cannot be, be reduced to the technological context in which they have been employed thus far. That means that in this specific, in this specific sense, the meaning of this concept transcends the meaning of their past and present contexts. An implication is the concepts are in fact abstract entities. As such, they are ontologically different from social material technological artifacts or systems. So in, in my work, I have uh, developed this point as saying that one concept have two functions. One is to structure phenomena, parts of reality that we already know. But another function is to look ahead to possibly novel phenomena and parts of the world. And that that forward looking function of concepts requires that you have to severe them from the context in which they have functioned thus far so in the sense they that they 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 have some really novel features the fourth uh, problem of the strong interpretation is uh, of uh, techno science is this that uh, that usually material and social realization of scientific projects they take place at much smaller spatio-temporal scale than is the case with technological pro projects. Yeah? So uh, the science you do in a laboratory, it's mostly closed. Technology takes place in the world. In the world. And this means that the implied social and normative issues regarding science and technology, that they also differ significantly. OK. Some proponents of the strong interpretation of techno science uh, ad address such issues, but uh, many are uh, rather vague and abstract about uh, these issues. The first point is this that uh, if it's generally true that science discovers because it invents, actually, what follows logically is that all results of scientific research, including its theories, are in fact inventions. Huh? That's a logical implication. If this is if this is the case, they would all be patentable if they uh, meet the usual criteria. So this means that the the uses could be privatized and exploited for profit-making purposes of commercial industries. Huh? So this is a consequence of this idea that uh, science discovers because it invents. Huh? And this, this consequence is, I think, first, it's in contradiction to the patent laws. Patent laws explicitly exclude the patenting of scientific theories. But second, and that is important here, it also seemed to contradict Lella's critique of commercialized science mentioned in the previous section. The final point here, and maybe not everybody agrees with this, but uh, if we employ the broader European notion of science, and I prefer that, huh? science or in German Wissenschaft, in Dutch Wetenschap, huh? in French science, uh, I don't know what that is in Croatian, whether you also have this, but this broader European notion of science includes disciplines such as anthropology, historiography, and philosophy, which are where the intervening with technology is less strong, far less strong, even if it's not necessarily up to it's far less strong. Okay, and my conclusion here is that the weak interpretation of technoscience is important and correct, huh? and it's still necessary to explain and defend it. Huh? However, the strong interpretation of technoscience cannot be justified. Huh? To constitute a genuine integral view of science, some theses of Lella's science and modernity should be qualified by examining the impact and implications of language, society, and normativity in more detail than is done in the book. Next slide, please, the final slide. 
yeah, concluding remarks very briefly. So let me say I've studied uh, the work of Lelas with great interest and sympathy. And his main work, Science and the Modernity, and especially his project of working toward an integral theory of science, diverse, deserves a careful study, critical debate, but also further development. One suggestion I made uh, concerning this further development is to interpret the notion of techno science in the weak rather than in the strong sense. Uh, the second suggestion is to study the major normative issues of our times and combine its results with, or maybe to integrate them into the framework proposed in science and modernity. Well, I hope that this conference will contribute to achieving these aims. Okay, the, the next slide has some of the, say, the references on which this uh, presentation is uh, based. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>